Hello there. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for joining us today, whether you are here on site with us uh, or virtually. We are excited to offer uh, our first Friday Forum series. And this month we have our two candidates running for mayor of the city of Sheboygan. Um, incumbent Mayor Mike Vandersteen and contender Alderman Ryan Sorensen. So first, let me say thank you to our sponsor, Prevea Health. Without their continued support, we could not make these programs happen. Uh, questions for this event were sent in from our Governmental Affairs Committee members, as well as community members in general. Thank you for sending in your questions. I will tell you, we received a lot of questions that an hour is just not enough time for us to get through. So if we do not ask it, I apologize. We will do our very best. Um, we hope that these educational opportunities to learn about local candidates will help you make the most informed decisions as you get out and vote on April 6th. Moderating for us today is our Governmental Affairs Committee Chair and Attorney, Josh McKinley. Josh, thank you for your time, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank both of our candidates for coming out today and joining us. Um, we received quite a few questions from people along the lines of, what do you think is the situation with um, diversity, equality, and inclusion, or DEI, here in the city of Sheboygan, both the city as a whole as well as within the city government? I'd like to give each of you a chance to talk about um, that issue and whether you think there's anything that the city should be doing to improve diversity um, within the city. And so you each will have um, two minutes to respond to the question, and I would like to ask uh, Mayor Vandersteen to get us started. Thank you very much, Josh. And first of all, thank you to the Chamber for organizing this opportunity. Pardon me? Your mic's got to turn. to move down here if that Well, let's start that again. Thank you very much uh, to the Chamber for hosting this event. It's great to be here and um, we appreciate everyone's interest in, in, uh, in city government and the election coming up. Uh, to talk about diversity a little bit and inclusion, um, Sheboygan is a, becoming a more diverse community. Uh, we're already a majority minority community if you look at our school district and, and the population in the school district and that population is just going to uh, become more a part of our community so we're heading in that direction so this is a very important issue um, the, uh, the I made a trip over to Appleton to investigate their diversity campaign called uh, respect and uh, dignity and uh, this really has worked out well for the city of Appleton because, you know, when you talk about trying to change the minds of people in our community, you really need something that includes them in the picture rather than something that they just want to change. And those people need to be treated with dignity and respect as well. So I'm really looking at something that's more inclusive. Um, I also know that there's a local committee that's been meeting, and I think we have to take a look at the things that that local committee's coming up. The city itself needs to make some changes, and we're gonna be dealing with that this fall when we put together mm -hmm. our next uh, strategic plan. The strategic plan uh, for the city of Sheboygan, uh, we're just finishing up on our first five-year plan, and so we're gonna have a real involved process that we go through at that time, and I think we'll have a, a, a different uh, look uh, on this issue because it really wasn't included in the last strategic plan, and so we're gonna be, I think, looking for a lot more citizen input, and uh, hopefully we'll come up with some real goals that we want to achieve both for the city and for our community as a whole. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks again for the Chamber of Commerce for hosting this forum today. Um, diversity, inclusion, and equity. These are, these are some key phrases that, that mean a lot to everybody across the city. And, and this has been a big issue that I've been a part of um, for, for quite some time now. I've been a founding member of the Sheboygan County Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Belonging Initiative. And this group is primarily focused with identifying a lot of the gaps that we're having in this community in terms of how we're addressing diversity and equity and inclusion. 
I think that there's a lot the city government can do. I think especially in the mayor's office, a key, a key responsibility that the mayor has is ensuring that we are making appointments that reflect the true diversity and different talent across all boards and commissions in the committee, uh, um, the city government and elevating everybody's different perspectives. And also from a business standpoint, this has been a huge issue that I've been talking with business owners about as well, and the difficulty it is to recruit and maintain and attract diverse talent from across um, our, our area. One business owner that I was talking to was, was telling me about the difficulty that they're having with recruiting and maintaining their diverse uh, staff. Some of their highest staff pay, staff members are paid, um, they, have, they come from diverse backgrounds, but they don't feel welcome, they don't feel included in this community, and they choose to commute more than 45 minutes every single day. They choose to raise their families elsewhere, they choose to spend their money elsewhere while we're paying them and they have their job foundation here. So I think when we're looking at diversity and equity, we need to look at many different issues, whether it's housing, whether it's healthcare, whether it's um, jobs and recruitment and attracting folks here as well and ensuring that their voices are heard and are reflective in the city government. Thank you. Now, I'd like to apologize. I neglected to give you an opportunity to give an opening statement. I was too anxious to start asking questions from the audience. <laughs> so, um, I would like to give uh, Mr. Sorensen an opportunity first to give a three minute opening statement about what's motivating you to, to run for mayor. Yes, awesome. Well, thank you everybody for having us today. Um, and thanks uh, Deidre Martinez and the Chamber of Commerce for having this forum today. I think it's, it's important to democracy that we hear our thoughts and share our ideas for everybody. Um, but for those that don't know me, my name is Ryan Sorensen, um, and I'm running for mayor of my hometown. My Sheboygan roots run deep. I was born and raised right here. Uh, graduated from South High School, uh, worked my way through the Sheboygan Area School District, and graduated from UW-Milwaukee. We all know that Sheboygan is a wonderful city. We have so many great businesses and organizations that truly value our community. And we have great people, just salt of the earth, that truly care about their friends, families, and neighbors. I'm running for mayor because growing up, my parents taught me to never sit on the sidelines and complain, but to instead get in the game and make a difference. And that's what I've done my entire life. A few years ago, I ran for city council and beat a 10-year incumbent. And I also, like I said before, I'm currently serving as the city council president. Additionally, I'm chairman of the Public Safety Committee, chair of the Transit Commission, vice chair of the Public Works Committee, as well as a member of the Capital Improvements Commission. I think that all these different opportunities have shown you know, just how great the city is, but it also really identifies a lot of our different challenges. And I think our biggest challenge that we need to address is Sheboygan is facing a tale of two cities situation here. Over the last decade, the Sheboygan community um, had, have, had had over $1 billion of investment, and this is wonderful news. However, during the same time period, students in the Sheboygan Area School District on free and reduced lunch has gone up by double digits, one third of our residents still struggle to pay their utility bills, and one in three children go to bed hungry every single night. We need a new approach in, serve, in terms of how we're serving and helping our residents. And I think with a new fresh approach with city leadership, um, I think we can really tackle and make a big difference in our community. There's a lot of other issues that we need to address as well, whether it's affordable housing, fixing our roads, and ensuring that we can fully recover from this COVID pandemic. We're not out of the woods just yet, but I know if we work together, we can get a lot of work done here. Um, so, like I said before, my name's Ryan, and I'm excited for this, uh, this forum and sharing uh, my ideas and talking about the city that I love so much. So thanks, everyone, for coming out today. Well, thank you for that question and an opportunity to respond. You know, the, the job of mayor is something that really requires a lot of experience. And uh, in the past, I've had the opportunity to get involved in our community through uh, organizations like the Sheboygan JCs and Rotary. I participated in many community projects through those organizations. And um, I've also served on, on many citizen roles in our community on boards like Big Brothers and Big Sisters, YMCA, United Way, the City Planning Commission, Capital Improvements Commission, the Board of Park and Forestry, uh, Sheboygan Development Corporation. And all of these experiences give me a, a great wealth of knowledge and networking so that we can really move our city ahead. Um, one of the things that uh, I did when I was young is I, I ran for alder person uh, back in 1973. And I served for two terms and decided to run for mayor, and I wasn't elected that time. But what I decided to do then is, is not just, uh, you know, take a leave of absence, but to get involved in Sheboygan County. And I became a supervisor for 15 years and then serving as county board chairman for four years. 
And that was the best mayor and training program that I could have had because it allowed me to understand how another unit of government works is, and I could see more opportunities for our city and our county to work together. As county board chairman, I set up meetings with uh, Mayor Perez and later Mayor Ryan. So we met on a, on a regular basis twice a month to talk about the things that our communities had uh, as far as needs and how we could both work together to solve those. And those have led to many uh, great projects, our joint purchasing agent, the in-health clinic that we share, and then our joint dispatch. All these things came because we initiated more uh, conversation and tried to work together. You know, the taxpayers are giving us their dollars and they want to know that they're spent the right way. And if we're not working together, then we're not spending those tax dollars efficiently. I've also had some other roles now as mayor. Uh, I'm on the uh, Urban Alliance Board, the U.S. Conference of Mayors Water Council. I'm serving as chair of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence City's Binational Mayors uh, Organization. And all those, again, give me a chance to find the best practices in other communities and try to bring things home for Sheboygan. I'm really working to continue to build a better Sheboygan. Every day when I get up, I'm looking for ways to solve the problems that we see in our communities so that we can move Sheboygan ahead and be the best that we can be. Thank you. One of the uh, questions that was brought to us has to do with parking and downtown parking. Um, as customers of downtown businesses, many people are frustrated with the need to pay for parking and as proprietors of downtown businesses. Um, sometimes there's a concern that it's difficult to stay in business when people have to pay to visit your shop. And so I was wondering if you can speak to um, the value of charging for downtown parking, um, whether it's worth uh, what it costs. And if uh, Mr. Vandersteen could start, that'd be great. Thank you very much for that question. You know, um, I went to a, a, a seminar on parking and uh, the, the gist of it was, if you, if you don't uh, charge for parking, you should. And if you don't, you should go the other way. You know, it, it's one of those things that uh, it doesn't have a real easy answer. But I think the system that we have in Sheboygan really works. Um, be, because we, we have parking meters on A Street, we don't have um, workers parking in those spots. They're open for the people that come to do business in downtown Sheboygan. And there is a very, it's a very reasonable fee for parking and it's free after five o'clock and on weekends. And then in our lots, uh, we do uh, have reserve parking and that's uh, I think uh, $25 for a month. And if you wanna go a little bit cheaper, you can uh, park on the streets. You can get a hanger tag for your car and you can park on any of the side streets on 7th or 9th or any of the cross streets, but not A Street. So it's a really good system. I think it works. There's always gonna be somebody that's gonna complain because uh, they can't find what they want. But uh, you know, we were looking at building a parking ramp years ago, and if we would have done that, we would have drastically increasing our prices for parking. We've tried to do our best to keep everything reasonable, and we have parking assessment districts where all the merchants downtown share the cost of plowing and maintaining those lots so it doesn't become a, a taxpayer uh, uh, expense. And so it's a shared type of thing, and I really think that what we have works and we should continue it. All right, I think uh, parking is, is a huge issue and this is something that I've been talking with local business owners on 8th Street. I think our current system is a little outdated and old and I think that we need to get creative in terms of how we approach uh, parking. If you look at what other cities do, um, you can pay on an app, you can pay on a debit card. Um, a lot of folks sometimes don't carry change around anymore um, and I've been one of those folks where I've wanted to you know, go to the library or um, go, go grab a coffee at Paradigm, and if I couldn't find a quarter between my seats, I'd have to park a few blocks away um, and run up. So um, we need to get creative. We need to work with um, our local businesses in the 8th Street and downtown area. Um, and I think we, we can have partnerships with the bid district too in terms of how we can move forward in identifying um, what works and where. I think in some situations, <coughs> I'd be all for removing some meter parking and maybe doing 15 minute <coughs> increment parking as well. I think we can work on, and we have done some um, parking holidays where parking is free around uh, the holidays so we can incentivize uh, local shopping. Um, so I, I think overall we have a pretty reasonable system, but I think there's always room for improvement. Um, and that's what I've been hearing from folks um, 
in the downtown area and a lot of several different business owners as well. I mean, thankfully we don't have uh, to pay uh, for parking like folks in Milwaukee and Chicago do. I um, mean, you're paying $13 an hour. Um, but I think what we have is reasonable, but I think we gotta look at um, where we can step it up and make some improvements as well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sorensen, what is your vision for future economic development here in the city of Sheboygan? And particularly when it comes to business development. Awesome. So, so this is a key issue that I've been hearing a lot about. And for my day job, I work with a lot of small businesses all across um, uh, northeast Wisconsin. And I think business development, this, is, this has been a really big challenge for a lot of municipalities um, over the last year with the pandemic. I think what we need to do as a city is really get creative and focus on what our strengths are and where our weaknesses are in terms of how we can develop and how we can strengthen our gaps. Um, with economic development, it's, it's much more than just bringing businesses to the community, but it's also ensuring that they can grow and thrive and that they have the resources for their employees in terms of when it comes to housing, whether it has a strong workforce, whether it's um, access to the highways and utilities. And I think <coughs> Sheboygan has all of those features. So with economic development, we need to sell Sheboygan. We need to sell the community. We have some great, um, strong-hearted people here. And I think once we come back out of this pandemic fully, I think um, our business park will be filling up. I think uh, we'll be able to expand and grow the Fresh Tech Innovation District as well. And I also think we need to focus on how we can support um, local businesses downtown and small businesses here as well so that they can grow, so that they can be prosperous, so that they can support their families as well. So I don't know if I can fully answer this question in two minutes, um, but I think uh, we have a great team um, in the city, have different partners all across uh, the county, whether it's the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, um, whether it's our local department staff or folks in the county. But we also need to um, be strategic in terms of how we're educating the future. Um, I'm probably gonna go down a rabbit hole here, um, but in terms of, we need to identify gaps in um, jobs that we're experiencing in the city. And I think working with the Sheboygan Area School District with our technical colleges in the area, that we can fill those gaps. And once we fill those gaps, we'll have those job opportunities so businesses can be successful for future generations. Um, Mayor Vanderstein. Thank you very much. Um, our economic development uh, was really going well before COVID. You know, we had uh, multi-million dollars uh, invested in our community, of our businesses expanding. And um, when COVID hit, a lot of that dried up. The city really uh, felt that we needed to continue to allow um, more money to be spent to develop our, our new business park, the South Point Enterprise Campus. And now when COVID is ending, uh, hopefully we're gonna see some more uh, interest in that. Uh, the city is reaching out to uh, businesses, uh, mainly up in, in the Green Bay, Fox River Valley area, as well as we have a real estate agent that's working the Milwaukee market for us. And we really hope that we can bring some new businesses in, as well as support the businesses that are in Sheboygan that want to expand. But one of the real issues that's stymieing us in, in some of our additional economic development is our workforce. The workforce is a huge issue because we, we, before COVID, we had two to 3,000 jobs that were available all the time listed and uh, businesses couldn't find enough workers. And that's still the case today. And uh, we have to work harder to, uh, to have more housing available in our community. And we also have to have, uh, find ways to bring more people in. Uh, the um, Economic Development Corporation has, has tried to have job fairs and organize those for our businesses, and to a certain extent they've been successful, but we have to find ways to, uh, to get more places where, where, uh, where people can live. We're doing a housing study right now, and this will kind of give us a guideline as to how many more housing units are needed in the city of Sheboygan in order to serve that workforce. And the other thing you have to remember is that if these people are driving in from Manitowoc or Fond du Lac, the city isn't gaining the uh, full value of their employment uh, and the spending power that they have. So this is a very important item that, uh, that needs to be worked on and uh, we really have to concentrate on that workforce development. Thank you. 
Um, it's almost like you anticipated my next question because I was going to ask next about um, residential development and housing. Do you believe that there is a shortage of housing? And for you, Mayor, it sounds like there, you believe there is. Um, and if there's a shortage of housing, um, we've seen a lot of luxury condo type developments or luxury apartment type developments recently. Do you believe we need more of those? Do you believe we need more affordable housing or even rent controlled housing? Do we need more houses for single family residences? What type of uh, developments do we need going forward? Thank you for that question. That's very important. The, um, the city of Sheboygan right now is redoing a housing study. The last time we did it about three and a half years ago, it showed that we had a less than 1% vacancy rate in the city. And we haven't seen any studies from any of our developers that shown that we've really eroded that and, and gotten above 1%. So a good community should have about a six to 7% vacancy rate. You know, when you are, have somebody looking for a house, they want to see several options, and really, for many types of housing, people don't have any options. There's just this one option, and sometimes that's not what you want, and then you go and you look elsewhere, uh, other than, than the city of Sheboygan, perhaps, for that home. The, uh, the, the real you know, crux to, uh, of things that we need to, to concentrate on are, are low-income housing. Now, in the last uh, term, we've added over 609 units when the Oscar project is finished. So we've really put a lot of effort in that area, but it's my feeling that, that it's not going to satisfy that demand. And I'm looking to this study to really tell us how much more we need to build in order to serve the demand that's there for low-income housing. All of these units in these other projects, like the, um, the, the Badger State Lofts, and uh, the Oscar Project and uh, Washington School, you know, these are, are, are pro pro uh, apartments that are priced roughly, I think a one bedroom was about $640 and a two bedroom was $730. So they're really hitting, the, uh, I think, a sweet spot for many of the people in Sheboygan with their incomes. And the, uh, the other projects that we've had have been market rate apartments, but you know we need those too because they've tracked it over 60% of the people that are coming to those are empty nesters, and that's opening up other homes in the community for families to enjoy and raise their family in as well. So housing is, a, is definitely a huge issue that we, that we need to take a new, fresh approach on. Um, the mayor mentioned uh, that, that there's a housing study, another housing study that we're waiting for, but you need to understand the methodology of how this study is being conducted. Folks that are spending more on housing that are impacted by affordable housing have not been included in this study. <clears throat> more than 40% of our community is spending more than 30% of their income on their housing needs. By HUD's <clears throat> definition, that is not affordable housing. So we do have a housing challenge in this community. Fundamentally, I think we need to diversify our housing stock in general. We need to ensure that senior citizens can afford to stay in their homes. We need to ensure that younger folks, like myself, can afford to plant their roots and grow here. We also need more single family homes and not uh, fancy luxury apartments that cost $1,800 a month for a one bedroom apartment. Um, I think that there's a lot of different challenges as well that business leaders face. I mean, four years ago when I was elected to the city council, we always talked about, oh, we have 4,000, 3,000 jobs available. And it seems like we can never make a dent on that. Well, maybe we're, we're taking the wrong approach in terms of how we're, how we're solving this issue. And I think housing is a huge component that we're, that we're really missing the ball on. I served as the chairman of the, um, uh, the Sheboygan County Housing Coalition, working with nonprofits across our community, um, whether it's Salvation Army, whether it's Safe Harbor, whether it's the library. Um, we're, we're seeing an increase in, in um, homelessness and so social services as well. The libraries is, is a social service center for folks. Salvation Army, their homeless uh, residents, they're increasing, there's a waiting list for them as well. So housing, we need, we need to look um, holistically in, on that end as well, but we also need to look why it's more expensive to build here in Sheboygan County. We're missing the gap on a lot of trades. We need to work with LTC. We need, we need more plumbers. We need more electricians. We need more carpenters as well so that we can, um, so that the, um, the cost of housing goes down as well. So thank you. So as you're both expressing a concern about housing and a need to improve in that area, um, what practical steps can the city take and particularly what steps could you take as mayor to effectuate real change in that area beyond doing studies and finding out more detail about the need, but what can you really do to fix the problem? Um, Mr. Sorensen. 
Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot that, that can be done. Um, fundamentally, we need, we need to work with, there, there are groups out there right now that, that are trying to tackle this, and they're clamoring for, for a voice, uh, their voice to be heard from the city government. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, nonprofits out there that have identified gaps that see firsthand um, who the, the clients that they serve, what they're experiencing. I think having conversations, bring those folks to the table, listening to them, I think fundamentally we'll find out a lot of our issues in our community and where we're missing the gap. A lot of, a lot of folks experience housing insecurities in a, in a wide variety of different ways. Homelessness in our community looks different than it does, say, in Milwaukee or Chicago or another big city. A lot of what we're seeing here is a lot of families doubling up. We see a lot of couch surfing. We see a lot of folks possibly sleeping in their cars and parking lots. I think these are huge issues that, that we're not thinking about or plugging in in terms of how we're doing these housing studies. Um, but fundamentally, like I said before my last statement, it's, it's more expensive to build in the Sheboygan area than it is in most other parts of the state. And a huge part of that, um, is, that is that there's such a lack of, um, of folks in the trades um, plumbers, carpenters, electricians. We need to prioritize those job skills trainings. We need to work with and have partnerships with the Sheboygan Area School District to show that students that these are job options, that these are a need in, the, uh, in our community, making sure that we can um, strengthen those parts of our economy so that we can build more homes, more single family homes, more affordable housing for everybody, because um, that is a huge component in how we can be successful as a city. Mayor Van Thank you very much. One of the ways that, uh, that we're going to, I think, solve this problem is to uh, work with developers that uh, can bring more projects to our city. You know, the, uh, the city can't, can, or rather they can, uh, support some of those with some of the funds that we have. We've uh, been giving most of our developers maybe a 10 or a 15 percent developers incentive for some of the projects that we're bringing to the city. And we want to continue to, to prioritize the low-income housing that um, that we've seen here and uh, and see that grow. The, the 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 people that are that are homeless right now, you know, we do a homeless count a couple of times a year, and we've always come up with maybe 15 to 25. But when I talk to members of the school district, they say that that number is, is closer to 250 or 300 when you consider the people that you don't find out in a community at night when you do that count. So it's a very important issue and it's something that we need to continue to look for solutions to. Uh, the, um, there are, are some helps with some of the agencies in town, but for the most part, they're putting people up in motels for short stays. We really need to find something that's a little bit more permanent uh, housing for these people that are, are in between and having a lot of problems. Thank you. Um, very quick question that came from the audience today. Um, can each of you indicate whether you own uh, real estate uh, here in Sheboygan, the city, such that you're a local taxpayer? Um, Mayor Vandersteen? Um, yes, I've, uh, I've, I'm uh, on the third home that I've owned. Uh, for a period of time, uh, my, my second home we, uh, we kept as a rental property, so I have experience as a landlord. I gave that up, and now I'm just owning my one single family home, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, I'm different than Mike. I'm uh, like 40% of other city residents, I'm a renter. So I'm a younger guy <laughs> and planning my roots and making sure that one day I can buy a home in this community. Thank you. Well, I'm sure you knew this topic would come up, but um, I have a question about roads. Um, roads have been very, uh, a pressing issue of concern for people in the city for a very long time. And um, I know that progress has been made in recent years and since uh, I believe it was 2015, um, but many people are still dissatisfied with the progress. So I'd just appreciate it if each of you can speak to um, the progress that's being made what we could possibly do to do better if, if you think that would be appropriate and how we could afford to do better if, uh, if you do think we should do more. Um, uh, Mayor Vandersteen. Well, first of all, uh, the, 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 uh, our streets have really been a priority for me during my first two terms. And during that time, we've been able to increase the average of streets resurfaced by that we're tripling it well, from 1.4 average miles prior to when I came into office up to 4.2 miles now in the last seven years. The, 
this, the city has made a couple of moves to try to solve this problem. One is to buy our own paving machines so that our own staff can go out there and apply asphalt to the surface of the streets that we have. This has been a, a good strategy and about 45% of the streets resurface every year are done by our own crews. But we have an impediment because uh, we need somebody in many cases or most cases to mill that old asphalt off and the only service that does that right now is Northeast Asphalt. We always get pushed around in their schedule and many times we don't get our crews out there till late in the season and they don't have as much time to do the work as they'd like. So I think one of the things we wanna look at is maybe partnering with the county or doing it on our own, but by our own milling machine so that we have uh, the equipment that we need so that we can do our roads when we, when we wanna get them done. And that way we'll be able to have that crew in our, in our machine that, that uh, applies the asphalt as a paver uh, do much more than we are currently right now. Uh, but when you do streets, it's not just the street that you're dealing with, it's all the stuff that's underneath it. So there's many things that have to go into uh, a street resurfacing because you don't want to have to uh, to dig it up to change some of the utilities that are underneath it. Right now we have a 14 year program that we're in. We're f the fifth year into that program. It's a big job. We have over 200 miles of streets and we need to uh, continue to keep that program on track. I'm surprised that the roads question came up. Um, um, no, the ro roads, roads are the number one issue that I've always um, uh, have been hearing concerns from, from uh, citizens all across Sheboygan. I think right now the biggest challenge that we have is that we, we kind of have a throw everything against the wall sort of strategy, whether it's with the wheel tax, whether it was when we formally did um, uh, assessments and, uh, as well. Um, the, the problem is, is that we're, we're not consistent in terms of how we're, how we're tackling this approach. I don't know if, if folks remember a few years back when we did the hot in place asphalt situation when uh, we hired a, an out of town contractor that came in and put asphalt down the road and that project didn't work too well. So we wasted time, we wasted a whole construction season and we wasted taxpayers dollar. When we're hiring out of state, when we're hiring contractors to help us out with these programs, we need to ensure that we're respecting taxpayers dollars and we're setting a high standard for these projects to get done. I know our DPW staff does an amazing job um, with the work that they do, but they deserve a long-term strategic plan that, incur that um, encompasses funding strategies and planning strategies as well. And fundamentally, we also need to hear from our citizens about what roads they feel like need more attention. Well, whether it's the main arteries, whether it's some of the side streets as well that have been far too neglected from citizens all across the city as well. Um, I think also the, the county, I think they do an amazing job um, with, with partnering with, with the city in, in terms of the tools and supplies that they uh, give us as well, as well as they pay a good chunk of uh, the, the revenue with the sales tax, so thanks to the folks at the county for that. Um, but uh, we need to diversify our revenue streams as well. And I think that there's some creative ways in, in terms of how we can do funding. We need to look at what other communities are doing. Um, the DOT rated Wisconsin's infrastructure at a D. Um, so we got a lot of room for improvement. We got to think outside the box because what, what's, what we're doing now is not working. Um, and that's what I've been hearing from a lot of different folks. So then my natural follow-up is what are those creative outside the box funding solutions that, that we should be looking into? Yeah, I think um, kind of just shooting a spitball in here and going down the list. Other communities have gone out for a referendum. Other communities have accessed grants from the state DOT, from the federal uh, DOT. Um, there's also a lot of different creative partnerships that you can do with universities um, and colleges across uh, of Wisconsin that, that have research funds and how you can better manage and retain um, road repairs. So I think that there are, there are a lot of those opportunities we need to explore. Other communities have done it. I think we're missing the mark on a few of them. Um, but I think in terms, that, that's a good foundation of what we need to look at in terms of how much it's gonna cost and how much it's gonna benefit our community. Yeah. Um, any further comments on that, um, Mayor Vandersee? Well, I, I really think that we, we continue to always look for better ideas, but uh, we have a, a city that was almost, almost all concrete streets at one time, and we find ourselves in a position where all those streets have outlived their useful life and now the strategy is to take the, uh, the streets that are um, carrying the most traffic and try to replace them in concrete and use asphalt for the remaining streets to give them a new surface and, um, 
we we also stepped up our maintenance of those streets, so we're filling the cracks now on a regular schedule, and we're trying to make that asphalt last for or the good 15 years that it should. In the past, we weren't doing things like that, and so the maintenance of these streets is very important that in the three, five, and eight years uh, down the road, they're getting the attention that they need. Um, as far as funding, um, we, we appreciate the county's contribution to their sales tax. We do have a wheel tax, uh, but uh, the council has not wanted to go and, and fund that with an additional $10. That would, would help out. That would bring in probably another uh, half a million dollars, but that's only going to do about a half a mile of streets. The biggest mistake I think the council made a few years ago is when they uh, uh, stopped assessing for streets. That's something that people had done for years and all of a sudden we pulled the plug and that also uh, uh, lost funds that we could have used to add to our street resurfacing. So I think the strategy that we have right now to uh, employ our staff and, and use the machinery ourselves and most of our street resurfacing is the best route to go and we'll continue to work that so that uh, we accomplish our goals. Um, regarding the idea of using assessments on the streets, Venner uh, uh, just indicated that you believe that we should reevaluate using those. Uh, Mr. Sorensen, do you believe we should reimplement having assessments for street repairs? At this point, no. And, and when this when this was brought up, you know, th this this for, for road assessments, you know, it was this, you know those folks that are on fixed incomes that when we repair their homes on the corner, they would get slapped with a five thousand dollar bill I think in terms of if, if we're doing road assessments we need to look at what the actual benefit is of how many roads we're repairing and what the impact is on on the citizens we can't just nickel and dime and throw extra taxes and fees at citizens to fix the roads if we're going to fix the roads we need a long-term strategic plan and how we're going to be funding that and making sure that that's sustainable okay um, do you have any uh, response to that well I think that you know, now that we've stopped it, it's going to be very hard to put it back in place. Uh, the um, the problem is that was we need more funding. The city, uh, for several years, bonded for some of the streets resurfacing that we did to increase it. We're now finding ourselves at a level where we have to really pull our, our, ourselves back from, from bonding for these street replacements, and we have to fund them out of our operating budget. So unless we, you know, increase... Uh, our taxes or, or other things, it's not going to happen. You know, Ryan just talked about new revenues to come in and, and, and mentioned all those things that we could tax people more, we could, bond, we could uh, have a referendum. Um, so maybe the referendum is the way to go because that, that way they would tell us that they want to spend more money. But we need to increase our revenue streams in order to really solve this pro problem uh, quicker than we are currently. Thank you. Shifting gears uh, fairly dramatically, um, what can we do as a city to better attract and retain millennials and um, Generation Z um, to our city? Um, Mr. Vanderstein, if you could start us. Well, I think, you know, it's really important that we make Sheboygan an inviting place for everybody. We, we want these uh, people that grow up in Sheboygan and stay here and the people that come here to work and, uh, and make a life for themselves to be real comfortable and, and, and really, you know, make Sheboygan their home for the long term. So I think some of the efforts that we've been, been taking place with uh, things like the Levitt Amp concerts, the uh, outdoor dining that we did during COVID on A Street. Uh, we're, we're starting to change, I think, the image of Sheboygan and make us more attractive uh, and more of a, a fun-loving place to, for, for them to, to enjoy. You know, we have a great art center. We've got a new art preserve that's opening up. We have the Wild Center. Uh, there's a lot of entertainment options and things to do in this community. And uh, I think we need to continue to work on building on those types of things. And the other thing that we really need to do as well is, is our diversity and inclusion. This has to be a part of it so that all the people that come here, no matter what background they're from or race they're from, that they feel comfortable that this is their home and people accept them. I think this is an awesome question, and this is this is this issue is a big case study in why I believe we need some new leadership um, in city government. For the last ten years, this has been a question we've been asking ourselves as a community: How do we recruit? How do we attract um, and maintain young talent? And the best solution that we could come up with was building luxury apartments. Now, 
those apartments have been filling up with folks primarily that are empty nesters and over the age of 50. Well, that's great. But then at the same time, when we're trying to play catch up and replicate what Madison, Milwaukee are doing, by the time that we have these um, built in Sheboygan, they miss their mark in the market. I think that we need to have a new fresh approach in terms of what we're doing and, and making sure that we actually have affordable housing. We need to listen to the, the voices of millennials and what they need in this community. When I first ran for council, this was a huge issue and a huge conversation. How do we attract millennials? How do we bring in Gen Zers now um, in the community? And nobody's really actually asked those questions or elevated those voices of folks um, and individuals. When I'm mayor, I'll definitely be pointing um, some younger folks to boards and commissions so that their voices can be heard, so that we know what they actually need and want. I think in terms of work hard, play hard, we need to ensure that um, we have sound uh, job skill training programs here so that we can keep and retain um, younger folks, but we also need to ensure that we have companies um, that, that, that we're recruiting that, that support us in 2021 and moving forward, whether that's tech jobs, whether that's um, entrepreneurial um, ship programs as well, and different startup opportunities. So, so there's a lot of key foundational things there as well. We also need to look at in terms of how we can grow and expand the entertainment. We need to look at how we can grow and expand different opportunities um, for, for younger folks to plant and uh, grow their roots here in the community. Something that COVID has highlighted for many people is that with young families, it can be challenging to find good activities for young children um, in our community. We have the Children's Museum, we have the Public Library, both of which were closed down for kids to be able to use in these last few months. Um, is there anything that the city should be doing to um, better serve young families, uh, especially during our long winter season? Uh, Mr. Sorensen. Yes, and this is this is another issue that I've been hearing from a lot of younger folks as well too, especially when it's winter and what is it, three weeks ago when it was negative, you know, 20 degrees. And if you got three kids running around the house, you know, you're probably, you know, getting a little cabin fever for sure. I think foundationally, this is another huge example of where we need to listen to our citizens and see what they need, what, what they need. It's, we have some great entities like the library, like the, um, the Children's Museum, but those are only certain segments in our, in our community. We need to ensure <coughs> grow and strength and making sure that we're protecting our parks, making sure that we keep um, them to be pristine as they are. But we also need to look at different opportunities as well. Um, at the South, uh, South Pier is a huge example. We used to have triple play fun zone there. I was, you know, I was one of those kids running around and playing in there too, you know. So we, we've had these new experimental ideas, but they've never fully stabilized. So I think the city needs to identify what we need, what we're missing, but we also need to make sure that we're supporting those so that they can stay along, stay along for the longevity in our community as well, and finding those different opportunities and growing and expanding them. One of the biggest issues I was pushing for, I don't know if folks remember um, back in the 80s, I wasn't there, but uh, a lot of our parks used to have um, ice skating rinks in most of our parks. You know, and, and I, I've been keep pushing this issue. Well, why don't we do something as simple as an ice skating park? Sheboygan Falls has done it. Manitowoc's done it. Milwaukee's done it. A lot of other communities around the state. I think we're just missing some of these fundamental foundational ideas that we can bring back that offer more activities uh, for younger families and for everybody. Mayor Vanderstein. Um, I think that, you know, during COVID, you know, we, we really closed everything down, the library, our parks and everything. And so that created, you know, some issues for families because they didn't know where to go, although they, they did use some of our parks that weren't closed. And we finally opened up our, our playgrounds, which I think maybe we're too careful with, but, you know, we, we weren't understanding COVID at that time. So... Uh, I think that there are a lot of activities in our community for Sheboygan. I certainly would be in favor of, of seeing these expanded, but many of the things that uh, parents are looking for is, you know, these places where the kids can go and jump on trampolines and, uh, and things like that and play uh, like uh, the spaceport uh, used to have. These are things that need to be done by a private entity, and while we can incentivize those people and, and bring them into some of our programs, that create jobs and, uh, and, and help to set them up. It's still gonna take people that wanna uh, solve those uh, needs in our community uh, in order to, uh, to see these things uh, built and, and come online. So I think we have to continue to promote the activities that are here and, um, and, and try to get more people maybe involved and, and taking advantage of them. But, um, you know, Sheboygan is a great place to raise a family, and, um, and if, if you look a little bit harder, you're going to find many of those opportunities in our community. 
Um, Mayor Vandersteen, is there anything further that the city should be doing to facilitate uh, businesses and especially smaller businesses in our community being able to function with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Um, do you think that it's mostly over or are there further steps that we should be taking? Well, I think I've done a lot to help our businesses out. During COVID, um, uh, the, uh, I put on a seminar for them to help them get through the winter. Uh, we, we brought them together with some representatives from the American Restaurant Association. And then we also had a local discussion of things that we can do. Uh, the city took advantage of some of the COVID funds that we received from the CARES Act. And we made loans available for businesses that were kind of falling through the cracks, the businesses with five or fewer employees. And we were frustrated and the businesses were because if they had taken advantage of the PPP program, they couldn't participate. Well, when they redid some of the restrictions on the CARES Act, we finally were able to deal with more of those businesses, and we recently uh, reissued uh, the call for uh, um, them to apply for about $200,000 that we still had available. And just this week, we sent out another notice to them that we had a consultant that was coming in, and we could uh, set them up with a one-on-one -on -one discussion with this consultant for the restaurant industry to help them to come up with some new ideas, whether it's th doing a better job, uh, with uh, delivery of food and things like that, making their operation uh, more uh, compatible with the COVID situation that we're dealing with. Uh, the other th thing that, um, you know, they, the, the businesses in our community, I think, have responded fairly well to that. And, uh, you know, we've put some programs out there, and we just hope that they apply and, uh, and get the help that they need. We want to see them survive. Small Business Saturday was a great event. Uh, the City Hall really helped them to promote that. And the businesses ha had a great response from our citizens. And maybe we just need to run Small Business Saturday more often to encourage people to shop local. I think, I think this is definitely a key issue. We're not out of the woods just yet. We're still in this pandemic. Businesses are still struggling. <laughs> Um, and, and, and looking at the city, we still have over $200,000 in terms of money that we got at the onset of this pandemic that we need to distribute to local businesses. A lot of businesses that I've been talking to and engaging with are frustrated that there is that they have, there has not been a clear coordination in terms of how we're supporting the businesses during this pandemic. Folks are still struggling. These are the conversations I'm hearing, whether it's the local bar that you know had to shut down, whether it's the local coffee shop that had to cut its... Um, staff in half, whether it's the manufacturing plant that had to shut down for two weeks because they had an outbreak. Folks are still struggling. Um, a lot of businesses are still in the red and they're just barely hanging on. I think the city needs to make sure that we're allocating this money properly, but we also need to, need to make sure that we're reaching out. I think, you know, we don't, we, don't, we don't need to spend taxpayer dollars on a consultant on what to do. We have great partnerships right here in the city, like the bid, like the Chamber of Commerce, that can f facilitate these, these conversations so we can listen directly from the businesses and what they need and what can make them successful. On the onset of the pandemic, with the help from the Chamber, we facilitated a lot of these conversations from restaurants um, and local taverns in the area, asking them, what do you need? How can the city be effective during this time? So as the chairman of the Licensing and Hearings Committee, we introduced a bill to reduce and get rid of red tape in the city ordinances that would allow for outdoor cafe seating and I don't know if folks remember um, 8th Street during the summer, but because of our, our um, changes in cutting that red tape, we were able to ensure that restaurants could get creative in terms of how they serve their patrons, keeping staff, staff safe and their customers safe as well. I think we need to continue that, ensuring listening directly from the businesses what they need and then acting on them of what they're hearing, what we're hearing from them as well. Um, what has been the financial impact on the city government of the COVID situation and what is going to be the impact going forward as a result of that? Uh, Mr. Sorensen. Yes, and, and this, is, this is a tricky question. It's been a question I've been asking uh, since the pandemic started. The, the problem is we, we don't fully know what the full picture is just yet. Now we just had um, our budget uh, that we passed back in October. Um, and until we know what the final impact is from this pandemic once this is over, and we'll see how long it takes us to recover then we'll have a better foundational understanding. But I mean, looking at it from the start, we know that um, hotel revenue from room taxes, that's been significantly low. We know sales taxes have been kind of all over the board from a county perspective in terms of what we're getting from road funding as well. 
that's been kind of all over the board as well. So the, pan the, <coughs> the pandemic, in terms of how it's impacted our budget, is not just known yet. We know it's going to be difficult. We know um, 2022 is going to be more challenging in how it's going to impact our budget. But a, a big priority of mine is ensuring that we can preserve um, the services that we provide in the city, police and fire, library services, fixing our roads, um, ensuring that those are preserved so that we can move forward and that we can minimize our impact from uh, the, the financial impact that uh, COVID has had on all of us. Um, Mayor Vanderstein. Thank you. Um, through September of last year, we calculated that uh, we'd lost about $1.2 million in revenue due to COVID. Uh, and this was things like the room tax. The, um, the other thing that was kind of interesting is things like water. Mm -hmm. uh, NEMAC closed down for two months and they use about 20% of the water that's produced in the city of Sheboygan's water department. So that was about a half a million dollars in losses of water to industries and then another $250,000 of losses as we, uh, if we clean that water in our water treatment plant. Um, in addition to that, uh, there was uh, loss of revenue in our park departments with rentals of, of, of uh, park facilities. And, and so altogether it came to about $1.2 million through last September. The CARES Act took care of many of the COVID expenses that we've had, and it allowed us to buy some um, IT equipment uh, for people to use laptops when they had to work remotely and things like that. Uh, our transit department did get a lot of help from the COVID bill, and uh, it's allowed them to repair a, a roof, uh, cover some of our expenses uh, as far as our, our local share for transit, and, uh, and to buy some new equipment to put online in our, our system. As we go forward in 2022, I think that's where we're really gonna start to, to feel the real impact here. And, uh, and we just don't know uh, how bad it's gonna be yet, but it's gonna be a very, very tight budget this coming year. So it's something that uh, is gonna take a lot of planning. You know, right now the federal government is looking at uh, the American Recovery Act and um, we hope that that is gonna give some money directly to cities and, you know, Right now they're talking about some dollars that are huge and yeah, hard to imagine that we could even, you know, get that much money but from them. But we are going to need some help and uh, to dig ourselves out of the hole we're in. Thank you. Um, there are various local groups that like to encourage people to grow locally or to buy uh, products locally, um, especially in retail, to buy locally. And I'm wondering if there's anything that the city should be doing to encourage that to happen. And if so, what practical steps do you think you could take as mayor to encourage those programs or those interests to be successful? Mayor Vanderstein? Well, I think that uh, number one, our farmers markets are, are a fantastic way for that to happen. They're well attended by both the farmers as well as the public. And it's a great market that, uh, that, that serves that need to a certain extent. Uh, but we've also worked with some of our, our, our uh, not-for-profits that are trying to uh, get more of the fresh produce uh, that, that, um, into the food bank and getting it out to the families that uh, really need to uh, have more fresh fruit, food in their diet. So I, I think, um, you know, our food bank system is a, is a really good resource for us in this area, as well as the, the local farmers. The other pro thing that we're working with is our, our neighborhoods and allowing them to have some community gardens. Uh, we have one on Erie Avenue for the Gateway neighborhood, and then we have two huge areas on the north side and the south side that the, uh, the Hmong uh, uh, Assistance Association manages uh, for the Hmong farmers in the area as well that grow things for themselves and things that they bring down to the farmer's market. I think fundamentally, I think the city needs to do whatever it can with our taxpayer dollars is ensuring that our tax, pay, our tax dollars stay local in terms of when we're doing building projects, whether we're doing street repairs, um, whatever it is, a, a business incentives in, in the TIF district, um, we need to ensure that we're keeping the money here. I think that um, sets a foundation of, of, of keeping the money local as well. I think the city can look at what other cities are doing as well in terms of a buy local ordinance ensuring that when we go out for bids and projects that local businesses get a priority first um, and making sure that they're a best fit for a community. I'm gonna make a, a plug as well too. Joining the chamber is a huge benefit. I'm, I've been an active member of the chamber uh, for several years now and I'm a member of the deep dive uh, group, meet every other Thursday. 
Um, this is a great opportunity to meet with other local businesses as well, network, understand that we do have a l l large variety in different businesses all across this community as well and plugging with those as well. But again, in terms, the city needs to be an advocate in how we're helping local businesses grow and thrive. If they, if they need resources and we identify that there's barriers that the local government is putting up for that business to grow and expand, then the government's got to get out of the way and help that business be successful as well. Um, a lot of businesses that I've been talking to ne don't necessarily feel like that's happening to everybody and that the city does pick favorites. I think we need to um, really address that as well too and um, uh, work when, we're, when we're working with folks either downtown or on the South Pier or anywhere in this great city. Well, we have time for one more question as long as we cut your time in half. So if you can answer in just a moment, um, but what should the city do with the property for Memorial Hospital um, once that is vacated? Um, it's my understanding that that'll be turned over to the city. So Mr. Sorensen? I think it needs, it needs to be determined by what the neighbors want. I think that's, that's a pretty dense neighborhood. I know a lot of folks live in that area as well. Um, so it, it needs to be what the neighbors want, I think, in terms of single family homes, like I've talked about before, would be um, appropriate townhouses, incorporating green space as well. I think that would be a good fit in the neighborhood. Whatever goes in that space needs to fit the neighborhood, needs to fit that community. Uh, Mayor Vanderstein. Um, right now, the, the city has uh, an agreement with the hospital that they're going to work with the neighbors to uh, come up with plans that will, will create uh, a single family neighborhood in that area. And uh, they'll be hiring a development company and um, they have three years after the hospital moves in order to demolish the hospital. And then after that, uh, that neighborhood will be developed. And we've had many meetings with our neighborhood associations in that area. The, the neighbors are involved. They've set up a website. They've gotten the input from the neighborhoods. So I think we're really in a good place that, you know, that's the highest producing um, area in the city of Sheboygan for tax dollars. We don't want to do anything to, uh, to destroy that. We want it to be positive and we want to continue to see the types of homes that are in that neighborhood uh, take over that site where the hospital was located. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank both of you for coming and joining us today. Thank you for your uh, very uh, diplomatic and polite exchange, not turning this to a violent debate like we've seen in so many places in politics these days. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Purveya Health, uh, for helping us to fund this and put on the event. Um, if any of you in attendance or anyone attending virtually um, has any uh, topics that they would like to see us cover in the future, I would ask that you share that with us um, so that we can make sure that those topics are covered for you in the future. Um, in addition, oh, and so with that, I'd like to give you each an opportunity to give um, a closing comment. Um, Mr. Sorensen. Awesome. Well, thanks again, everybody, for coming out on this lovely Friday afternoon. Um, thanks for the chamber for putting this on. Um, so at the beginning, I talked about a tale of two cities situation. So I, the, the point of my campaign and a lot of folks that I've been talking to is really highlighting that Sheboygan County is experiencing a lot of prosperity and progress. However, there's still a huge chunk of our population that is being left behind. And we need a new approach in terms of how we're helping those citizens. In 1862, Abraham Lincoln told Congress that the dogmas of the quiet past cannot inadequately help the stormy present. Right now, we're in a stormy present. We need new leadership in how we're supporting our community because we must think new, we need to bring new ideas to the table. Your businesses have not been successful. If you stayed the status quo, you guys have innovated, you've gotten creative. I think the city does need to do this the same. Um, if you're interested in following our campaign, check us out online, sorensenforsheboygan.com, and we're on Facebook as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, you know, in the past eight years, I think I've really been a change agent for the city of Sheboygan. We've picked up our, our, uh, our, our roads construction. We've really accentuated our communication with our community. We've added the Sheboygan Insider, which is a monthly newsletter. We put in uh, Nextdoor as a communication tool for our city and our neighborhoods to use. 
I've really worked hard with our neighborhood associations to grow them from two associations up to 12 now and really help our, our police department implement and keep their uh, community policing program in place. And this has produced a 31% decrease in part one crimes. I think the safety of our community is really in good hands with these projects that we've done and the work of our police department. So I, I hope that you'll uh, support me and this this is my, uh, my interview for uh, my job for the next four years, and I hope you'll decide to hire me for the next four years and keep uh, Vanderstein in office to keep on building a better Sheboygan. Thank you. Thank you both.